Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our sixth annual International Women's Day event. Uh, my name is Andre Simon, and I am the CEO of the Finca Impact Finance Network. Our network is made up of 20 microfinance institutions and banks. We have almost 10,000 majority local staff around the world, and we service nearly 2 million clients across five continents. Um, uh, just to lay out some of the logistics for today's discussion, we will um, proceed with our panel. We'll be taking questions at the end, um, but if you have burning topics that you want to put top of the agenda, um, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be available on our website at fincaimpact.com. Um, uh, if you are in the Twitter sphere, um, and you would like to tweet about this or at us, you can tweet at Finca Impact. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our amazing panel. So um, starting with uh, Zara Wardak, um, she is the division director um, for Finca Impact Finance. She leads our operations in Afghanistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Jordan, Kosovo, and Tajikistan. Um, she previously served as the regional director for the Middle East and South Asia region. Um, under Zara's leadership, our operations in the Mesa region expanded to cover two full service microfinance institutions and one bank, each of which has now more than 25,000 clients. Think Impact Finance, I think more importantly, perhaps, has also become a catalyst for women's economic empowerment in the Mesa region. 61% um, of Finca Afghanistan clients are women, and in Jordan, that number is all the way up to 92%. Next in our lineup, I have Mami Kalanda, who is the CEO of Finca DRC. She has 18 years of international experience in microfinance in DRC, Tanzania, Zambia, and Uganda. Um, Mami's story is really interesting. She started as a loan officer and of course is currently the managing director um, of the largest microfinance institution in the Democratic Republic of Congo with more than 440,000 clients, uh, 1,600 bank agents, 23 branches, and more than 600 employees. Uh, moving next to Lisa Kuhn. Um, Lisa is an independent consultant. She has over 20 years of experience working at the intersection of financial inclusion and women's empowerment. Um, she has specialized in participatory research for women-centered product and program design and holistic approaches to ending poverty. Um, she's currently consulting with the Social Performance Task Force, um, supporting the COVID-19 client interview tool. Um, we'll be talking about that later and using the findings from that data collection effort to improve um, the overall microfinance sector's response to the crisis. Um, Dr. Cleopatra Mujeni. Uh, Dr. Mujeni is a, a public health policy and gender expert. She has 18 years of experience in Sub-Saharan Africa, and she's carried out a lot of research, policy analysis, fundraising, strategic planning, um, and, and the development of evalu and evaluation of programs. Um, she leads uh, ICRW, which is the International Center for Research on Women, um, Africa, where she oversees the regional programs and a bench of experts that conduct gender-related research across a number of thematic areas, strengthens the monitoring, evaluation, and research capacities of organizations, and works with key stakeholders to develop solutions that address gender issues. And last but definitely not least, um, our very own Scott Graham, who is the Director of Customer Research and Field Data Services, um, Scott has uh, extensive field experience. Um, he's worked directly in um, microfinance operations for over eight years um, in Africa um, and uh, pivoted from that to help establish and lead Finca's customer research and field data services covering areas such as financial inclusion, household consumption and living standards, business income and job creation, women's empowerment and the impact of off-grid products. Um, and he um, and the work that he and his team do um, serves as a, a guidepost for us in terms of how our operations are performing on um, social impact and inclusion. So welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to start before we get into the panel by setting the scene. Um, while many of you who've joined us today um, are working every single day to shine a spotlight on the importance of gender parity, 
Um, I suspect that you are like me, grateful for the way International Women's Day helps us to make that spotlight just a little bit bigger. Um, it's certainly why we host this panel every single year. So let's recap why that topic is so important to us. Um, very simply put, women still have less access to education. Um, uh, women face disparities in access to health and education, particularly at the primary levels. Uh, women are more likely to do the lion's share of unpaid home work, domestic work. Um, uh, young women especially are saddled with um, as many as three times um, the number of homework uh, per day. Um, uh, and in some countries, the disparity is as high as seven times. Uh, women are very much still unequal participants in the workforce. Um, the gender gap in labor force participation is still 47% um, versus 74, and it's about what it was in 1995. Uh, it, that's because women continue to be overrepresented in informal livelihoods, um, especially where those where they have no labor protections, um, and especially those um, that have been hardest hit by COVID. And that's um, something that we're gonna talk about a lot today. Um, in addition to that, um, if women do get out of um, work, out of the household um, to find formal employment, um, they frequently find themselves um, in livelihoods that are less profitable. Um, and we know that even within the same sectors, um, women frequently earn less than men, um, which uh, again um, is something that we have talked about very frequently and want to continue to address. All of those things are things that we've talked about many times in the past and we need to continue focus on addressing them. But then on top of that, we now have COVID. Every single person on the call today has in some way experienced the impact of COVID over the last year. Um, but today we want to shine a special spotlight on how women in particular have been impacted by it um, and how the gains that we've made in closing the gender gap really may be at risk due to it, um, particularly in those countries where women were already significantly disadvantaged. Um, to, to lay the foundation for the discussion, I'll just give some quick statistics. Um, in Q4 of 2020, there were about 250 million full-time jobs lost due to COVID-related disruptions. Um, those losses were concentrated among informal labor um, that makes up about 60% of the global workforce. Um, the post-COVID recovery globally is pretty uneven. Um, we have uh, some markets like India and China that are expected to have um, a solid GDP growth of more than 6%, um, but we anticipate that the growth in the poorest countries is going to be significantly lower. Um, the positive trend that we had achieved in terms of poverty reduction, which was still not at the SDG goals that we had set for ourselves, but nonetheless was positive, um, has actually been reversed. Um, in 2020, uh, we know that about 150 million people um, fell back into extreme poverty. Um, and there's real concern that the ranks of the poor could grow um, by millions more in 2021. So that is the foundation for the conversation. Um, I am very excited to welcome everyone. Um, and without further ado, let's get going. So, Zar, first question to you. Um, why has microfinance focused on women in particular? Uh, Andre, in your introduction, and thank you for that introduction, um, uh, a lot of the reasons you already mentioned for why microfinance uh, focused on it and continues to focus on women. Uh, it's a lot of those um, uh, gaps and uh, equal treatment for women is why we exist and why we support women. Uh, this is not news that a majority of women have uh, historically have had less access to credit compared to men, regardless of many researches showing that women usually tend to be uh, more responsible borrowers, um, competent managers, and also very good at savings. Um, and also, despite a lot of steady progress um, in reaching the unbanked population, women still lag behind uh, in access to financial services. 
Um, we have, as you mentioned, Andre, uh, we have experienced that deeply rooted social inequalities usually push women into less profitable, uh, less profitable businesses. And these are the same uh, inequalities that actually also limits their access to technology. And these are the technologies that in the first place actually should enable them uh, to uh, gain access to products, services in a more seamless way so they don't have to leave their homes and their children um, and uh, they can actually have that access uh, from their own uh, homes. And regardless of how much uh, we have gained, the gender gap still hasn't changed a lot since 2014. And as of today, we still stand 100 years away from uh, actually realizing true equality between men and women. And uh, according to some reports, uh, we still see uh, that the average man is still 9% more likely to have a bank account uh, compared to an average woman. Um, the amount, uh, well, this actually amounts to a gap of roughly 200 million uh, people. And Andre also, uh, one of the greater reasons also is a lot of women uh, are um, operating in informal businesses. And today there are 740 million women that are working in informal um, sectors, which pre-COVID, that was a huge number that needed to be tackled. Uh, but then post-COVID, uh, this uh, actually has further impacted women and their businesses and further widened the gap, which we really need to address as our response to the pandemic, but overall holistically to the inequality with women. That's excellent, Zara. So I, I actually want to come back to um, the digital and opportunities and also barriers later in the conversation. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, uh, before we get to that, though, you know, Mommy, uh, where Zara left us was, um, you know, on this fact that there are a huge number of women in informal employment. Um, and clearly that is a space that microfinance has a strong role to play. Can you talk to us about your thoughts on what an organization like Finca um, and other microfinance institutions can do um, to help address inequality? And how important is that in terms of our mission and our business model? Thank you, Andre. Uh, I think uh, Finca and most of microfinance institutions plays a huge role to address those inequalities and try to cover the gender gap. Uh, Zah just talked about uh, the, the informal. Most of uh, ladies, they are having informal activities. So Finca is helping those ladies to move from informal to formal. I can just take one life example. So a lady can start with a loan of $50. With that $50 being with Finca for over one year, that lady, if she's able to save a minimum of $1 a day, after 12 months can move the uh, capital from $50 to over $300. So this is what, where Finca come in, in creating opportunities for those ladies to create job, to improve the standard of living. And by creating that uh, possibility for that lady to increase the, the, the assets, it gives the voice to that lady. So microfinance plays a huge role in countries like uh, African countries where that lady couldn't have the voice because having $50 as the business equity, you will not have any voice because you have kids to send to school, you have uh, family matters to attend to, and that $50 can't help. By being with microfinance, growing the asset from $50 to 300, I've seen ladies moving from $50 to today getting a loan of over $50,000. Finca is giving a voice to those ladies in the community where they couldn't open their mouth because they had nothing. Now they can have a voice because they've succeeded, because they are sending kids to school, because they are having now kids that went to universities, they are doctors, and it gives them that opportunity to talk, to become the family pillars. So uh, microfinance plays a huge role 
to address the inequality because we are helping those ladies to become stronger in the community. We give them voice. We give them opportunities to stand up and talk. We give them opportunities to be part of the development that the country is pursuing. So uh, this is what I can get like the huge role that microfinance is playing in trying to reduce that gender gap. Excellent. Thank you, Mommy. So, you know, basically drawing a, a nice straight line for us between um, the importance of um, legitimizing self-employment opportunities, formalizing them, because ultimately um, what we're talking about is money is voice um, and, and money and having resilience is important, not just at the micro level, um, but also for standing within the community. Thank you. So, um, Lisa, you know, you have a, a really broad perspective across all of this, um, given your research efforts. Um, uh, can you share your view on this? Sure. Uh, women are, um, as we've noted, you know, concentrated in these low return sectors like the petty trade, the personal services, handicraft services, jobs. And uh, it's no coincidence that these are um, jobs that require or businesses that require less formal education and training, less of an upfront investment. Um, and one of the things about these um, positions in the COVID pandemic crisis is that they are putting women at higher risk in general. Um, women um, have this dual burden of being the primary caregiver in their home and trying to earn a, a living. And what has happened during COVID is that women are facing a really difficult decision about whether and how to resume their businesses, um, knowing that their businesses are putting them at, at higher risk. Um, and I can give an example that, for example, in Lima, Peru, um, two of the largest food markets, which of course food trade is one of the biggest you know, sectors for women to work in, saw that 80% of vendors tested positive for COVID-19. So many of the women that we interviewed had had family members and friends that died of it, and they were terrified, absolutely terrified of bringing it home to their families, but they absolutely had to have the income too. And so I think that when we approach how to help women recover from this, crisis, um, recognizing the emotional stress of having to be out there every day trying to earn a living and um, being fearful of, of contracting this disease is something to definitely keep in mind. Um, I think in general terms, um, you know, why are women in these sectors? Uh, you know, it has a lot to do with who they are and what they what resources they're bringing into the equation. We know that women have less access to education than men. Um, typically, they have less savings, they have less access to capital, um, it, you know, their networks are basically, you know, generations of women have been in these trades and in these sectors, and so that's what they're learning from their mothers, from their friends, that's who can help them get into business. And so there are a lot of um, structural constraints that are really keeping women in this space. And we as financial service providers um, also have um, typically can concentrate it on the small working capital loans. That's the main source of financing that's available to women. Um, but still today, women have difficulty accessing a lump sum to make the more sizable investments in their business. And, um, and they don't simply have the collateral, such as real property titled in their names that are as preferred by many lenders for, for larger loans. They don't have the social networks that include salaried professionals that are typically, you know, acceptable guarantors for financial service institutions. And so that also is keeping women in these more vulnerable livelihoods. And finally, women tend to choose the businesses that are compatible with their other responsibilities. So work that they can do from home, selling during the hours their children are in school, workplaces where they can have children present, um, work that children can help with, um, that's just a natural or work that's natural outgrowth of the work they have to do anyway. Um, and so that often kind of keeps women in these lower return sectors uh, and keeps them in, in a vulnerable place regarding their livelihoods. 
Well, that's excellent, Lisa. And, and you know, I, I find it super interesting because, you know, that um, that trade off, that really almost impossible trade off that you highlighted around, um, you know, accepting the risk of COVID versus the need to generate income. You know, that's one that we've seen playing out globally, not just in the most um, challenged uh, countries. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, there are structural impediments, I think that um, women in a lot of the countries that we serve face um, that are a little bit more unique. There, there are no social safety nets or those social safety nets are very, very shallow. Um, and um, and that the structural impediment, I think on, on the business side in terms of education and training um, and frankly, access to capital um, still remains really important. So I, I really appreciate that you highlighted those points. Um, so, so Cleopatra, um, you know, uh, Mamizar and Lisa have reflected on some of the most important aspects of inequality and, and what we know as, you know, financial service providers, um, but taking us up to a broader perspective, what are the two or three most important contextual factors that shape economic, women's economic participation um, over the course of their lives? Um, thank you. I think I think um, Zar, Mamie, and Lisa have really touched on all of the on all of these issues that um, that affect women, and and that will actually um, have a huge impact on their economic participation over the course of their life. Uh, when we we find we find that um, almost in some parts of the world, 83 to even 90 percent of women's uh, businesses are informal. We find that they're clustered at the bottom um, of, of, the, of the pyramid, that they're working in, um, in jobs that are not stable, in jobs that, uh, that are very informal, small businesses. And why is this? It's because from the beginning they have started, like I, I like to say, they start behind the start point. Um, when it comes to education, you you will find that um, less girls are graduate, fewer girls are graduating from primary school and going into secondary school and even and, and even at, um, reaching tertiary education. Um, the cultural factors uh, like early marriage, um, like um, like FGM, um, and and all these other contextual and cultural factors also affect um, their their economic participation. But the other thing uh, that touches on it, and I think when we now look at women who who are who are part of like the Finca network, so the women who maybe have even um, have the knowledge, have the network, so have actually uh, joined a microfinance institution and are saving money. These women also have other um, other constraints on them that men will not have even when they're saving. So a woman will go through life not only thinking about her, her economic success, but also the success of her household. We've talked about the unpaid care work. But when she's making a, a financial decision, she will be thinking about how this financial decision will impact her family, will impact whether or not her kids go to school. So like, Ma, like Mama was saying, she needs to save to send her, her kids to school. But when she has that $10, or that five dollars and needs to make a decision on whether to put it in the business or whether her children should um, should eat she will tend to, to put it into um, into the household matters so that her, ch her child gets uh, food to eat that night so even when women are making their economic decisions they're pulled I, I, I like to say they're pulled in a number of um, of directions that perhaps you will not men find men in the same in the same community or the same society having to think about when they make their financial decisions. Um, like uh, like uh, Lisa just said, even when she chooses a job, she will choose a job that will allow for more flexibility. When it comes to to COVID, um, for us here in Kenya, and I think also in many parts of the of, of Africa, there is a whole sector of inform of domestic workers who work on a on a day to day basis. Um, they will leave the informal settlements and they will find their way to um, to the middle class neighborhoods where maybe they can um, every day wash some clothes, do some cleaning, and get a, a day's wage. Now, when COVID nineteen hit, um, the middle class closed themselves away. 
So everyone could suddenly do their own laundry. Everyone was working from home. And we have a situation where these women whose entire economic livelihood, their entire household, their families were dependent on this day to day work that couldn't that they couldn't um, get access to. And from some of these women, they actually are members of of um, either microfinance, uh, saving in microfinance institutions or in chamas or in uh, or in um, table banking. For them, they actually had to pull out their savings in order to, to, to help the family survive, in order to put food on the table. Some of these women had children in school and when uh, COVID-19 restrictions were put in place, children are back at home, so they actually have to feed their children more often. They have to give them the full three meals a day and maybe there could have been one meal that they were getting in school. So I think, I think there when it comes to women, whenever a decision is being made and when a financial decision is being made or an economic decision is being made, there are a lot of things she's thinking about before she puts her money in one place or saves it in another. And even for those who don't have children, who may not, who may not be mothers, there is also in our societies the added, um, the added burden of, of um, caring for the extended family, caring for elderly relatives or parents. So these, these, are, these are issues and these are factors that sometimes are not thought about when we are when we're stratifying our, our our women customers so i don't want to take too much time uh back to you uh andre thank you so much cleopatra uh, but I, I what i really appreciate about your commentary is you know the highlight that you've placed on kind of the cultural barriers um that still exist that that just um you know drive the way we think about choice um, and also represent a, a really significant um, challenge for us as we try to, to achieve greater financial inclusion and greater parity for women. So just kind of summarizing, you know, what we've heard so far, you know, there are lots of, obviously lots of issues to be tackled in this conversation. Um, but, but I see three themes coming out, you know, clearly um, Cleopatra just touched on, you know, the, the cultural issues that need to be addressed and, and the fact that we need to kind of confront those almost explicitly if we want to move forward at pace. Um, uh, also, clearly, um, there are opportunity barriers um, and structural impediments that need to be addressed in terms of um, how we think about um, women's uh, financial opportunities and, and how we make credit available to them. And then Mami touched on, you know, the leadership gap and the fact that um, we need to help elevate women within communities um, because that creates also a positive signal to everyone else and, and helps to drive change. So thank you guys so much. Um, I want to turn it over to Scott now to, to actually um, ground us in some more data because we love data and, and we love really trying to analyze this um, in a way that, that helps us to focus even further. Thanks, Andre. Uh, let me just say it's a real treat to be participating in such a great discussion uh, with people who are really doing the work of women's empowerment every day. I don't want to take up too much time here because I think it's a really fascinating discussion that's unfolding. Uh, but since we're asking ourselves how a financial institution like Finca can advance women's empowerment in the context of all these issues that have just suddenly you know, come, out, come out before us, I thought it might enrich the conversation and really drive it towards a focus on financial services. If we look at a bit of data that shows us what the world is like and how all of the issues that were mentioned in the last 15 minutes or so really shape the experience of women as financial consumers, at least in one of our biggest and most important markets. So in that spirit, I'm going to share with you a bit of data from a market survey that we completed together with our friends at Finca DRC over the course of 2020. And this was a customer satisfaction survey that included about 2,800 respondents roughly split between Finca and non-Finca customers with about a thousand women in the sample. So this is a pretty big effort. And the objective of that survey was to give us a consumer's eye view on financial products and the organizations that provide them. So I'm not gonna present too much of it here, but just a couple of highlights that relate to the situation of women in particular, because if we want to use financial services to help them 
address the many sources of inequality and, and also bounce back from COVID, then this is kind of a baseline for us. So let's think about um, let's think about the customer journey. And the first step in that journey is product awareness, meaning what does a woman have in mind when she sets out as a consumer? And again, I, I just want to harken back to so much of what was just said, for example, about the, what Cleopatra told us about sort of, you know, what are the choice, what's the choice framework that women have? But even moving forward from that choice, um, one huge disadvantage that women have, even like, you know, as Cleopatra said, starting there from behind start, is that they're already at disadvantage when it comes to uh, having knowledge and awareness about the financial products that are in the market. So when we asked our respondents to name as many financial products as they could, about 22% of women could only name one or two products compared to 14% of men. And, you know, just pause and ask yourself, you know, why should there be any difference between men and women in terms of their awareness of the financial products? Because, you know, they're, they're, they're in, you know, we're, we sampled people from the same markets where, you know, banks and financial institutions are putting their messages out there. They've got the billboards, got the radio advertisements and all this stuff. And yet, um, why, why would there still be a persistent difference in terms of just basic awareness of the products that are out there between men and women? Um, uh, one other interesting detail here is that women's limited product aware women's limited product awareness, at least in the data, is strongly shaped by their age and by their education, whereas these are not important factors for men. Less educated women, as well as the relatively young and the relatively older women, are much more likely to have limited knowledge, while men are the same across all groups. Um, this limited awareness then directly undermines women's ability to find the right financial product. Fully one third of our respondents, female respondents, complained that it's hard for them to find the product they need. And unsurprisingly, this is very strongly related to the lack of product knowledge. So what are women looking for once they're in the market? How do they choose a provider? And is that different from men? Uh, in DRC, at least, we found that women and men have a very similar order of priorities that's driving their choice of, of service provider. And that that order really starts with convenience and simplicity and then eventually moves to cost. But there is one really important difference that we found between men and women, which is that women put the agent banking network at the very top of their list, while for men, this is preceded by ATMs, which happens to be the very last thing that women care about. Um, and we got some really illuminating open-ended feedback explaining this difference. Uh, I'll just mention that men are more drawn to the prestige of using an ATM and having a wallet that's you know, fat with plastic cards, while women were putting greater emphasis on convenience. And we also got some feedback that men were more concerned with privacy issues and less tolerant of service disruptions and agent liquidity problems, perhaps because they're doing larger transactions. Um, so I'm going to end this very truncated customer journey and hand it back to the panelists. But just uh, one last one last uh, thing to reflect on here is what women and men exper actually experience once they're in the bank uh, and and the, the stark difference between the way that men and women are treated in the very bank once they finally made it across this obstacle course of barriers and low, you know, navigating through with little information, having difficulties finding their products. Um, once they get there, men and women actually have very different experiences in the banking hall. So this is data, this is not from Finca, D Finca DRC, but it's from a mystery shopping study in Uganda where men and women researchers 
solicited credit at about 900 banks and credit unions across the country. And what they found was very eye, very eye opening. Women were much less likely to get a full explanation on the cost of credit, even when they explicitly asked for it. And I've also seen other data in Africa showing that women are more likely to be victims of overcharging at agents. And this was true, by the way, whether or not the agent was herself a woman. So issues, uh, you know, beyond all of the kind of entrenched structural issues that I think everybody has mentioned so far so eloquently, I would also think I also think it's important for us to consider the impact of discrimination uh, as a very live and pertinent issue to this discussion. So with that, I'll stop and hand it back to Andre and the panel. Thank you so much, Scott. So um, I just find this fascinating because, you know, there's a fairly rich body of, of research around um, how women relate to banking services differently on the relationship side um, and, and the fact that um, they take more time to feel comfortable with um, their financial partners, but then they tend to have a broader relationship with those financial partners, but there's a lot less research that drills down to this level of detail around um, what aspects of those banking services um, are really the most helpful to women. Um, and, and I think the, the elements that you touched on really deserve some unpacking with our panel. So um, I'll start with Zar, um, you know, really thinking about um, our own approach um, to making um, financial services more gender friendly. Um, what are the gender intentional ways that we can create better awareness and accessibility for female clients? Thank you, Andre. Uh, before I actually jump right into answering the question, I just want to take uh, 30 seconds and talk about what's at stake if we don't. Uh, create the awareness and the accessibility. So one of the latest surveys by McKinsey Global uh, reports uh, found out that uh, $12 trillion could be added to the global GDP by year 2025 by advancing women's equality. So that's why the importance, besides all other social reasons for why we need to make sure that this happens economically, this is really, really prudent uh, to us, uh, especially right now coming uh, out of the pandemic crisis, um, healthier for women as much as we can. So it's important that uh, public, private, social sectors, all of them need to act to close this gender gap, um, both in our work, but also in our societies. So our approach to address awareness and accessibility has always been uh, from within, uh, but externally um, uh, with our customers, we have been uh, intentional in the way uh, that we uh, provide products, services, and uh, alternate channels for women to be able to access our services. Uh, we have made we have made sure that um, we are removing all the barriers. And as Cleopatra uh, pointed out a few minutes ago, uh, in particular, the cultural barriers that women in different countries uh, are faced with. Uh, for instance, in Afghanistan, um, we, uh, uh, given the fact that there are a lot of uh, gender barriers for women to go to a branch, number one, they cannot leave their homes without an escort, father, husband, son, um, and uh, as well as the fact that uh, when they do come out of their homes, uh, they're not allowed to deal with men um, in, in, in conducting their businesses or uh, going to different financial services uh, providers. So with that in Afghanistan, we opened the woman only branch where from a manager all the way to the guard are women. Uh, providing a platform not only to provide access to finance, but then also to provide a social platform where women come together, they learn from each other, they share their stories, and a lot of cases being advocates for each other. So um, just removing that one barrier uh, enabled us to um, uh, basically open a branch that is highly successful, um, it actually um, uh, broke even um, four or five months earlier than our conventional branches. 
Um, so it has been extremely important uh, how we deal with women and their needs, because for women, uh, their needs throughout their life cycles are uh, extremely different. And it's also important uh, that women aren't uh, treated as one monolithic. Uh, and it's extremely important that financial services providers um, don't treat uh, their financial needs uh, as the same. So we have to make sure that we understand our customers' need in delivering product services and alternate channels. Uh, the way that it's actually um, addressing their needs. And internally, um, we uh, have been historically very keen on uh, equality when it comes both to our employees, but then also to our customers. But um, in 2018, uh, we revamped our uh, focus around uh, diversity, inclusion and belonging. We wanted to make sure that we are providing an inclusive culture for our employees that not only do we include them as part of our organization, but they feel like they belong as part of their our organization and they have earned their right to sit across the table and make decisions on behalf of the organization. So with that, um, I think um, with these five pillars of diversity and inclusion and belonging, um, it uh, informs FIF's broader uh, business model and also places a premium on investing in our people and the potential of our people. And, can, and, and I'm pretty sure that this will be um, our guiding uh, light into our response to the pandemic. That's great, Zar. So, I, I mean, you know, clearly um, the the benefits of a, a women, a singularly women focused offering um, really paid off in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that's the case in a lot of the countries that, that we operate in around the world. Um, I actually just saw a tweet from Microsave this morning um, talking about an initiative in India around identity registrations um, and how having a women only focus um, actually created a positive benefit um, to getting uh, more women registered. Um, so I think that intentionality around taking that and, and focusing on it um, can pay huge dividends, both in terms of inclusion, but obviously also in terms of the financial performance. So um, I appreciate that comment a lot. So Mami, I want to talk a little bit about agency and, and just for participants who aren't totally familiar with it, I'm guessing that most of the folks on the phone are, um, but it, agents um, are, are third party partners or um, partners with the institution um, that can provide clients with the opportunity um, to um, affect transactions outside of the bank branch. Um, and so consider it something like a human ATM um, with the capacity to do potentially even more. Um, so Mommy, um, agents have been a huge part of our strategy um, uh, across the network and particularly in Congo, um, helping clients to get access to their cash, but also make small deposits um, what have you been doing in DRC to make it easier for women? Thank you, Andre. Uh, as Scott said, in DRC, we realized that uh, female customers, they have that tendency to go and use uh, uh, agents than ATMs. So that choice is, no, is coming from the, the education level. So it presented also that most of our ladies, the education level is lower. Because it is lower, they need that uh, communication. When they are transacting, they need someone who can explain, who can let them understand how to, to do uh, a, a deposit, how to do withdraw, and maybe ask questions about one or two things. So our agent banking model has helped us to tap into that market where she was not feeling comfortable to be in the branch and transact, but because there is a merchant closer to her home, it is much easier for her to transact. Because the agent is a lady like her, she feels well understood by that agent. So with that strategy, we realized that our customers, women, they, they, they use an over 80% of our transactions are now going through our agent network. So realizing that, we change our strategy. Instead of just facilitating them to do business, 
we open up our agents banking by giving them possibilities to open accounts so that that lady who is actually excluded in the financial system can also get that motivation to open an account because by opening that account she can open it in a local language just talking to the agent who is the neighbor just talking to the agent who is a lady like her so that strategy is helping us to really build and uh, create that self-confidence in the ladies and help them to keep on transacting, keep on uh, doing savings because they have that facilities to do withdraw, to make the deposits. And with that, we realized it was good to also equip our agents with uh, financial literacy tools. So our agents are having videos. Those videos, they help them in opening accounts. They also help customers in learning how to use the, the accounts, how to do savings and the value of doing savings. Because we know that ladies, we are talking about digitalization, but most of them, even if you give to her a high phone, she will just give to the son. Son, can you try to test it for me? Is it working? So it's end up being used by the children. So if you put, even if you, if you put that digital training in the mobile platform, the tendency of using it is less by women than by men. And women, they have that tendency to leave it to other people. But by having that agent closer to her, someone who can listen, respond to her questions, and also try to help her to save more or to get a loan, it has opened up that uh, possibilities to bring in more ladies and also to build the confidence in them doing transacting and also the cohesion. The family cohesion is automatically coming up. So by doing that, Finca DRC has realized that the agent strategy is something very uh, good that is empowering ladies and it is giving them mostly that self-confidence to continue transacting, to not be excluded, and also the fact that they don't like to travel long distances. The agents, they are just in the nearby, yeah. where they are sitting, where they are having their home. So it is much easier for her to continue being an active customer than traveling all her way to the a physical branch. So the agent strategy is something that is helping to improve financial inclusion for women. Thank so, mommy, that, that, that's a brilliant um, point. You know, I, I think that one of the biggest lessons that we have learned over the last many years, actually, is that access really isn't enough. And um, what we are in the business of doing is fairly unique. Yes, we want to provide people who are marginalized with better access to financial services, but it's about building the understanding um, and helping people um, to participate um, in the economy where there's a really important role to be played. And so what you're saying is that um, as we're building this bridge to digital financial services, um, having somebody that you know, um, and in, in this case, an agent who lives close by, who understands you really well, um, can be a critical factor um, in helping you to get onto um, the, the roadway to the formal financial sector. So thank you so much for that. So Scott, really quickly, um, you know, there's a point that I, I would like for you to, to dive into a little bit more deeply for us, because I think it's um, kind of the flip side of, of what Mommy was talking about. Um, you know, there's research um, uh, that that shows that this um, that women don't have um, the same level of access to information um, that men have, um, and um, I, I think you've raised some data points about um, the vulnerability of women um, through agency potentially with overcharging and, and what have you, um, uh, and other um, treatment that we really would you know like like to eliminate um, throughout the agent network where we want women and men to be treated equally what can you do to mitigate that you mean to mitigate the discrimination factor yeah that, yeah. yeah 
<clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just mention a couple of things that I'm aware. Of. I mean, I think this issue of consumer protection in uh, digital financial services, particularly, is one that's really just starting to take shape. And you know, as more banking services are taking place in a less supervised environment, of course, it's raising concerns not only for women but for all kinds of consumers about the types of, uh, you know, the vulnerabilities that customers in general are exposed to when you have unsupervised agents um, providing services. But I, I think, and the gender angle of that is kind of like even still below the surface. It's not, it's something that I think we're just starting to, um, you know, starting to get our hands around. But one thing I would say in terms of, solutions is that um, there's there's both on the supply side on the demand side and maybe the easiest ones are on the supply side so for example as you see these uh, mystery shopping activities that are taking place at banks as a way of really auditing and holding banks accountable for fulfilling their obligations of disclosure a similar thing can happen on the agency side right so we can be auditing the performance of our agents uh, through like a mystery shopping exercise and making sure that they're providing all of the information that they're supposed to and that they're not, you know, doing so in a way that discriminates particularly against women. That on the supply side, I think uh, on the, so basically we have to step in and do the supervision that, um, you know, that, that's needed. I think on the, on the demand side, I think there's still a lot of room for, building the self-efficacy of consumers and uh and there's there's just an enormous work it, it's an it's really a convergence between themes of you know um financial literacy on one hand and also consumer protection on the other and and also just you know sort of general confidence and building women in particular building their confidence to be able to stand up and make sure that they you know, are not kind of brushed off with partial information, or if they have doubts that they that their transaction has been completed properly, that they're able to, you know, stand up for themselves and really uh, verify to their satisfaction that the service was done properly and there weren't any extra charges. So I think, you know, we need to think about both sides, but probably what's most, just because educating consumers is a big task and something that's probably going to be you know, as much as we want to do it, it's largely going to be beyond our efforts. It's a much, much bigger um, undertaking. But I think, you know, certainly we can educate our own consumers, but also we, I think that the kind of supply side interventions might be more, um, more efficient in terms of giving us an immediate impact. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. So, um, you know, checking our homework um, is really the key message there, I think, and then um, making sure that, that we are doing the very best that we can to teach our own um, customers uh, about the importance of um, protecting themselves. Um, so um, in case the audience hasn't noticed, um, we have a lot to say about this, and I've already been given the flag that we are running behind time. Um, so I'm going to pivot us to the, the next section, um, which focuses on a deep dive into the COVID data. Um, Scott, I'm actually going to hand it right back to you to take us through that, if that's okay. Absolutely, and I'm going to go really quickly here because uh, I think we want to give the panelists the, uh, more time to speak here, but um, I'll just quickly mention uh, a couple of issues. So first of all, this is data from a global survey that we conduct in Finca every year. It's called the Mission Monitor, and this year we had support from the Social Performance Task Force to include a section on the impact of COVID, and we're just starting to get into the analysis of the data set. Uh, it's quite large. We've got 18,000 respondents from all over the world, but I just want to highlight two main issues, which I think would give us uh, a way to launch into this final focus on COVID itself. Um, the first is that we clearly saw in the data how women are bearing the brunt of the burden for family welfare. That's been a theme that I think has been well established in this conversation and the unequal sacrifices that they made relative to men to tide their families through the crisis. So most women cut back on what they would call non-essential expenses 
and at a considerably higher rate than men. And keep in mind that this is from 18,000 interviews, so a large sample. And, you know, let's ask ourselves, why should there be any difference between women, between men and women in this respect? Why are women being expected to tighten their belts more than men? And who gets to decide what's essential and, and what isn't? Um, we, women were also much more likely to report that they had cut back on quote unquote expensive food items, probably referring to protein, and even to reduce the number of meals. And again, we have to ask why. Even if we accept that men have a higher caloric requirement than women, we can safely assume that men were already eating more than women to begin with. So why isn't the burden being shared equally? Um, finally, even about one in 10 of our female clients went hungry, about twice as many as men. And we might consider ourselves lucky that it wasn't even more, but it does still speak, the disparity does speak to a deep inequality in the household um, that this would be more prevalent among women. Um, I won't keep harping on this point, but let me just mention a couple of ways in which women's responses um, were also different from men's. First of all, they were more likely to use their savings to get by. They were also more likely to ask for help from family and neighbors, and they were more likely to sell their assets, even though that in particular wasn't a huge, a very widespread strategy. And as a final note, it's worth mentioning that very few customers borrowed money from their financial institution or got any kind of help from NGOs or government. And I think that harkens back to what Andre was talking about, how limited the reach of social safety nets are in the countries where we're working. But I think it also says something to us about the role of financial services in this crisis. So if financial services played a role at all, it would have been through the vehicle of savings, not necessarily through credit, at least uh, as a crisis mitigation strategy. Uh, so I think that that maybe gives us something to chew on as we shift the rest of the conversation to thinking about how we can uh, how we can use our considerable assets and and presence in people's lives to help build back a more a more robust economy and one that's more inclusive of women. Excellent, Scott. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, so clearly women bearing a disproportionate burden, but I think that last point that you landed on, which is um, the critical importance of, of building savings culture and supporting people in getting and accumulating savings um, in order to survive crisis and, and thrive beyond it um, is so important. So Lisa, you know, you've, you've been such a strong collaborator through SPTF um, uh, on um, looking at all of this research. Um, what do you see some MFIs doing to address some of these issues? Well, one of the, the things um, that came out of the survey very, very clearly is that women's businesses are being, have been shut down to a great degree. Um, but then what we've seen as time goes on is that the women are not able to shift back into the workplace. And largely this is due to uh, some of the childcare restraints. Um, I think uh, often the survey data is underestimating that. Um, in our survey, we didn't, we asked what one thing was most on women's minds or what one thing was on, was the biggest concern for uh, the, the client during the, the COVID pandemic. And um, childcare only came up in 3% of the cases and the ability to find other work or be able to work was the number one concern in most cases. Um, and what came, what was really interesting though, is when you look at the uh, questions, uh, the open-ended questions, you see childcare and education and the fact that the kids are not in school is still really huge for, for these women. Um, and it's really limiting their ability to shift into other businesses. And so what I've seen, what I've seen some of the uh, microfinance organizations doing is beginning to provide education on how the women can shift into other businesses um, via short video trainings on um, how to identify 
um, new delivery channels for, for, for their products um, that they can operate from their home based on the restrictions of the you know, health regimes in their particular situations and also recognizing their condition that they're basically locked in their house with their children right now and unable to go out and, and function as, as normal in the marketplaces. And so you see um, a lot of organizations um, experimenting with different digital tools um, to send video trainings to their phones, to use social media, to train the women um, to use social media and e-commerce. Um, I read an interesting article just the other day about how um, the, the e the, the making the leap to e-commerce is going to be one of the biggest um, challenges or the and biggest opportunities as well for, for women um, in the next um, few years. And so I think it's an interesting um, moment in that COVID is forcing a, a shift into that that space. And uh, I've seen quite a number of MFIs um, def, um, looking at how they can support women to, to move into e accepting e-payments, doing e-commerce, um, alternative um, delivery models, those kinds of things. I'm also seeing a lot of them um, addressing this issue of mental health and the and providing mental health support, um, grief counseling, even um, by phone, recognizing that the distraction of being traumatized um, by by very deep grief, by paralyzed by anxiety of do I go out and work today or not? Do I get food or not? Do, you know, am I going to put my family at risk? Like these kinds of things. Um, the financial service providers are actually connecting with counselors and providing. Um, distance counseling to their clients in order to be able to um, work through some of the mental health issues that are coming up with this crisis. Um, they're, of course, working on the financial side to provide top up loans combined with reprogramming and rescheduling loans so that they get fresh funds to invest in their businesses. Uh, a lot of women work in businesses that have very perishable inventory. And so when you're locked down for a month, two months, you lose all your inventory, um, but you have an outstanding loan. So what do you do? You know, and so um, they've been recognizing that that women need that those fresh funds. Um, I've also seen some forward looking things around um, for example, addressing the food security issue that Scott brought up, um, knowing that there would be future rounds of um, the virus coming through. Uh, I, one organization in Peru is working with their clients on kitchen gardens so that they are in a better position um, to maintain food diversity and food security in their household should they have to go back inside again. And um, I'm also seeing coaching programs coming up to support um, women in adapting their businesses to, to COVID. So those are a few things that are coming up. Um, and I think uh, the other thing that people are recognizing is that women's social networks are very, very stressed. And one of the biggest assets and one of the reasons why we do group-based lending is that women have these tremendous social networks that they invest in and in their community. And I feel like this slide that's up on the screen right now shows that, that these women are tapping that network to the extent that they can to get through this crisis, but, we, but also um, they're having to turn to many, many sources for support because their own social networks are equally, t um, you know, just the universal nature of this crisis hitting everybody has meant that um, these informal mechanisms of reciprocity and, and uh, mutual aid uh, are really um, stressed to the breaking point. And so we really do need to figure out how their relationship with the financial service provider can provide additional um, support to get through this uh, time. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, you covered a lot of really important points there, but um, one of them in particular that I want to highlight um, is this, um, the emotional stress that people are under. Um, and, you know, I think that um, we frequently talk about financial services uh, pretty clinically and um, in a transactional way, but the reality is that um, people's relationship with money and money decisions is highly emotional, um, particularly during times of stress. Um, and, and I think that that is something that um, we need to pay more attention to. So I'm really grateful that you brought that point up. Um, Cleopatra, um, just pivoting a little bit, um, 
in the rebuild project that you've been leading, um, you and your team have been looking closely at women's livelihoods in the context of COVID and, and the responses that have come to that from governments and donors. Um, what do you see as the, the main points of vulnerability in women's livelihoods? And, and how do you think that they should, um, how do you think we should shape our recovery efforts um, to address that? Um, how should financial institutions really step up in a way to help women overcome these challenges um, so that the next time a COVID-like crisis comes along, um, we're better prepared? <laughs> Andre, I think that's 10 questions in one. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, well, 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 thank you. Thank you for the questions. I'm not going to say one question. So the Rebuild Project is um, is actually looking at the effect of, um, of policy decisions on uh, women working in the informal in the informal economy. So it's a global project, India, Kenya and Uganda. And and I'm just going to briefly just talk about government responses before we go into into what can financial institutions um, do. So I'll give example Kenya um, of what Kenya did when when COVID-19 hit. So in about in March 2020, there were a whole range of fiscal and social protection policies formulated, just like it happened, uh, just like happened uh, across the world. So uh, in Kenya, there was a reduction of the pay as you earn uh, tax. This is for people who are on salaries. The turnover tax rate was reduced. Uh, the value uh, added tax was reduced. Uh, mobile money transactions um, were were tax free. Uh, up to ten dollars were tax free, uh, and then there was an economic stimulus package for small and micro enterprises. Then, as well as that, they also um, had some cash transfers to vulnerable households. These are all good things, but a lot of these things miss out women who are working in the informal sector and the informal sector is made up of a lot of almost majority women uh, women workers it also meant that women's businesses most of which are informal did not benefit from from these policies so when policies were being made uh, this is a snapshot is kenya but generally when policies were being made in our region um, the the account the, the thinking around a uh, majority of people who work in the informal sector, a place like uh, Kenya, 83% of new jobs actually come out of the informal sector. The, the, the lack of thinking around uh, any sort of uh, policies or any sort of rescue packages for the informal sector has had a huge effect on women. And so what we're finding is exactly what, what uh, everyone here has been talking about, that women's savings have dwindled, women had to sell, may have tried to sell assets, but sometimes there was not even anybody to buy the asset because uh, everybody was, uh, was just a strain. And, and then the networks that women will usually turn to are just as strain, just like Lisa said. So you can't even turn to the, to the people who you would usually turn to to help you out. So what we find is is until and unless uh, governments and policymakers recognize the vulnerability the, that that a majority of the workforce is actually um, is actually experiencing, and thinks about innovative ways to help these um, to help this workforce, we will we will be unable. And women, because women are already uh, are already more vulnerable, they will be unable to be to 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 come out of this um, this crisis stronger or even at the same level that, that they entered into it. So so I think that's important to note that a lot of a lot of the policies that were put in place could not help people in, in the informal sector. In places like Uganda, where there was restrictions on um, restrictions on travel, but essential work had to happen, and that was mentioned at the top of this panel. Women uh, who make up the majority of food sellers in markets had to sleep in the markets because they couldn't travel home uh, at the end of the day or travel to wherever they get their produce because of restrictions on travel. So you have you have women sleeping in markets for weeks on end. Who is taking care of the family? What about their health? We're talking about COVID, but in some parts of the world, you also have to think about malaria. People are sleeping in open air markets. What what effect does that have on their health? So I think I think when it comes to to that segment of the population, it has been 
sorely, um, sorely served by, by policy. But um, when we now think about uh, financial institutions and what they can do, <laughs> it's, it's, it's also a catch-22 because what, we could, what, what you could do is, um, is allow, uh, you allow your customers to have longer repayment periods. And, and as, as uh, Lisa talked about, maybe topping up loans. But I think, I think also, and something that has come through that, that touches on this agent, uh, women being more comfortable working with agents and, and um, the other services. I think what women are saying when it comes to financial services, when they go to a financial service provider, it's not just about the financial service, it's about the other services that come bundled with the financial service. Uh, an agent, the personalization of the service is one of it. Being able to talk to someone, someone who understands the different um, constraints that are going on in your life at a time like COVID, understanding that uh, your your income uh, may no longer be exist, it may have been decimated. That understanding is very important for women because the other thing with women, once they find a service provider that is that listens to them and um, and that responds to their needs, women tend to be very loyal. Um, they won't be changing their financial service provider as often. So I think as as service providers thinking about bundling services beyond just the finance, uh, the financial service. And then thinking about women as, as um, I think it was um, Zara who said, it's not, women are not monolithic. Um, really beginning to understand your customers and meeting your customers where they are, which is what you're doing, but also thinking about the services in light of the, the holistic nature of, of a woman. So thinking about her as a business owner, as a homemaker, maybe she might be the head of a single, um, single parent household. They have different needs and, and understanding those that the diversity of the needs is very, is very important. So when it comes to on the policy side, I think there was um, definitely under, under provision for a lot of women uh, when it comes from for the financial sector i think bundling other services beyond just the financial products is very important because that i think uh, will also will also help women come out of this uh, stronger thank you andre i hope i did justice to your 10 questions you did you did <laughs> and you even summarized the takeaways um so i i won't do that but i i do want to touch on um your comment you said you know women are not monolithic um i think that's clearly something that's come out in the discussion um but at the same time um, I do think that we have to act a little bit like a monolith right now to continue to drive this um, topic forward. So um, I, I appreciate that so much. Um, all right, folks, we are nearing the end of our panel. Um, we're a little bit over time, actually, but um, I'm so excited to hear what everybody has to say. I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, we are taking questions in the chat box if anybody has any, but but before we get there, I'm going to ask my panelists one final question. Um, you know, we've we've had um, a really broad ranging discussion here, but one that is clearly under the umbrella of the impact of COVID. Um, what has COVID taught us about what we need to do differently um, to drive gender parity and financial inclusion? Zar, question to you. Yeah, Andre, um, I will go back to, to, to the fact that uh, we need to be more intentional to understand the needs and the impact of COVID on women clientele. And um, it is important uh, to, impress, uh, to express the impact in a term that many have been using when they talk about the gendered economic and social impact of the pandemic. They call it the she session instead of first recession. So that that speaks volume to uh, in, in itself. And we have also seen across the board um, that it, the women's uh, it's not only women's immune system that have been uh, impacted by the pandemic and attacked by the pandemic. It's also their social uh, and economic gains of their recent decades. So if we are not careful in really treating women's 
the impact on women as important as the impact on the global population. Um, we will continue to remain in this she session, which is not good for anyone. And of course, not good for all of that 740 million uh, women that work in informal um, uh, sectors. So for us, um, we have seen that uh, a lot of our businesses, just like Lisa and Cleopatra clearly uh, talked about, uh, a lot of women, 60% uh, of women work in informal uh, services. So with that, a lot of the government aid, as Cleopatra uh, also talked about, it has, it has not reached women because their businesses are not uh, registered in a lot of cases. And also, um, if we don't respond to the fact that a lot of women has been out of work throughout, in a lot of cases, in some countries, for the whole entire year. And so that also is important that how do we bring these women back to the workforce and how has their needs changed, understanding those needs and establishing our course of action uh, accordingly. Uh, we have also seen, uh, and we talked about this, uh, the emotional impact of the pandemic on women because women were, are no longer just responsible for their day jobs but um, uh, it has uh, placed an increased burden on women to not only take care of uh, their families, their day job, but homeschool their children uh, in a lot of cases, and also take care of uh, elderly family members um, while they are carrying on uh, in where they can uh, with their day jobs and providing for their families. But these are some of the signs that we have internally seen as well, and we have been um, extremely um, deliberate on how we are responding both internally and externally to ensure that uh, the gap um, in access to finance is not further widened, but then also taking all of those other elements, uh, for instance, emotional support, for instance, bringing women back into the workforce, all of those things we need to be a lot more deliberate about and we have to really take that in mind as we are putting together our actions and our strategy and dealing with this crisis and coming out of this crisis and our customers coming out of this crisis as healthy as possible and as much as we can as an institution in a financial services. Excellent. Um, thank you, Zar. So that that was um, a very long list of lessons, um, but a, a really comprehensive one, and I appreciate it. Mommy, did, do you have any lessons learned from COVID that you want to add to that? Yes, Andre. Uh, thank you. Actually, what uh, we have learned is uh, culture uh, is something really to be looked at. Uh, we, if with this COVID, we realize that Yes, financial literacy for women. We need also to join men to support ladies uh, in the financial education and also give opportunities to, to women to really build that self-confidence. So what Finca DRC, for example, did was to create a women-only product. So we created a product that will motivate that's women to stay in the business. That's women to continue doing the activities, to continue doing savings, and uh, also the whole family to support that woman. Because of the culture, we see that the women after the, this crisis, they're having a lot to do. But on top of that, as the activity is growing, someone, someone else has to come and take care of that business because it is becoming big the man has to deal with it because he's the head of the family. So that culture beats won't help the women to really move on. So we created that lady only uh, product so that the lady can stand up. The family can also support because it is having good uh, benefits than the original uh, classic product. So, so that that women will stay in the business, so that that women can succeed to fight. We know that the COVID has been tough on the business, on the families, but they have to stand up and keep on moving. And something also we learn is uh, digitalization has helped a lot. 
our customers need to learn to save because customers with savings could at least have something when they, they we had lockdown they could use those savings to uh, to to cater for families needs and digitalization is something that will help those women to be uh, regularly saving or doing the financial behavior the digitalization is something that can really help during crises like this for women to stand up to continue doing their activities and also to save in security because if they're having cash when everyone is standing at home it will be difficult for that lady to say no to the husband when he needs money for a beer but if it is in the account that is safe it is safe for the family it is safe for that lady because after the crisis she can go back and return to the business and continue to build the assets of the family thank you Excellent. Thanks, Mami. Um, Lisa, anything you want to add? Oh, we may have lost Lisa. I think one thing that we've learned in this COVID-19 pandemic is that little differences between people's situations can make a big difference in how well they can weather the storm. Uh, you, you know, depending on what, how many children you have at home, um, whether you have an elderly person at home, what kind of work you do, what kind of work your spouse does, are you even married, um, what kind of home do you live in, is that home located in a place that you can walk to your work or are you relying on public transportation which is now shut down. I think like there, what we've learned from COVID is that there, that there are a lot of factors that make a difference in terms of both how well people can cope with the crisis, but also that affect what their likely success is in business, right? Um, that are often outside of our frame when we're looking at our clients as financial service providers. We're often looking very narrowly at do my clients like, I don't know, um, savings given to them in this way or that way. And it's almost like we're asking, um, I mean, we've gotten more sophisticated over the years, but sometimes I feel like the, the market surveys that we do are very much like, do you want strawberry or vanilla ice cream, right? We're offering ice cream. You want ice cream, please? And there's not a lot of um, contextualization of whether um, ice cream fits into the person's overall goal, right? Or the, the, the fi you know, how do financial services fit into people's overall life plan, ambitions, um, and I think one of the biggest takeaways for me is just that we need to build much more holistic picture of our women clients and the diversity of women clients that we have um, so that we can better serve the different sub segments of those clients, um, meeting them where they are, looking at how they, 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 what they're aspiring to and how we can help them get where they want to go with our product, uh, you know, our products and, and services. So I think that that widening the frame and then using that to build more uh, holistic profiles of, of our clients is one of the biggest takeaways for me. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that that holistic element really has to be there. Um, uh, so Cleopatra, um, I'm going to give you a question. Um, we've got some questions coming in in the chat, um, and and maybe you can weave your learnings from COVID into that. Um, so I'm combining questions on you again. Um, the question is, what are the policy recommendations that you would suggest um, to create better financial equity for women globally, and how can we advocate for those? Um, thank you. Again, big questions. Uh, I think, I think when we talk about financial equity, we need to talk about the world of work for women. Um, we know that women are, um, we know that women are um, clustered in low-paying, uh, less less um, less sustainable jobs. They are, if it's in agriculture, they're out in the fields. If it's in urban settings. They're, they own small businesses where they're often selling perishable goods, uh, and and their live their work is is not it's not re reliable, it's not um, sustainable, it's low paying. So I think if we want to start thinking about financial um, equity for women, uh, it's also how they make 
how they make their money so that we can talk about what they do with their money, how they save their money and how they can invest their money. So we need more women um, working in jobs that are more high paying, um, with uh, that are more dignified, that take into account the fact that women's uh, economic productive years are the same as her reproductive years. So we cannot ignore um, the issue of childcare and we need to be taking that into account. We need to be encouraging more women to get into fields or areas that are non-traditional, like move women from from working in the from working in the fields in agriculture into the value addition uh, part of the of the food chain, so that they can actually earn more for the work that they do. So the policy recommendations really would be about women's work and women's entrepreneurship. So encouraging more women's entrepreneurship and encouraging training so that women who are who have low skills or who have lower capacity, their skills are strengthened so that they can start businesses that will be more more uh, resilient to the type of shocks that um, the pandemic has has given us. The other thing is to make sure that there are social protection nets for women and for women's businesses. Um, it's important to note that when a woman's, when there is a shock like, like this one, women are going to pull out all the funds that they have in their business to support the family. The same thing happens if there's an illness in a family. She'll use all her capital to, to pay hospital bills. So we need stronger social protection for women and women owned businesses. So I think those would be some of the policy recommendations. There are a lot of them, but when it comes to the financial equity, you really have to be looking at all of the other the other policies and, and all of the other uh, factors, contextual factors that affect women's ability to access services when they are available, but also to be able to take full advantage of the available services. So I think I think you need to look at it holistically. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Cleopatra. Um, so we have three minutes left and we have one question. Um, and with everybody's kind permission, I am going to get the final word. I think it's actually a great place to leave this discussion. Um, the question is, um, interest rates of up to 4% per month tend to be constraining the loan repayments. Um, and, and don't allow for high business growth and savings. What can be done to ease this? Um, so there's a near term answer and there's a longer term answer to that question. Um, the reality um, going into COVID and over certainly the last year, um, Finca has done an enormous amount of work to restructure loan payments for clients um, to try and, and ease um, the repayment load that they have in order to make sure um, that, that they can maintain um, their own businesses um, and keep moving. Um, but when we look at the broader microfinance sector um, and, and across the whole world, um, microfinance institutions are under enormous pressure financially um, because of the COVID crisis, um, principally because just as we've discussed throughout this panel, um, our clients are facing unique challenges that make it exceptionally difficult for them to operate during this COVID pandemic. Um, and, and that really, frankly, poses um, an existential question around um, what we want to do with microfinance going forward. Um, there are some solutions, though, I think, that respond to a lot of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, clearly, microfinance itself has been working very hard to become more efficient. Um, investments are needed in order to automate a lot of the functions um, that are high cost and intensive. Um, in order to, to lower that cost so that clients can ultimately um, be the beneficiary of those savings. Um, but really, if we want to make sure that we are continuing to provide um, this broad range of services and support to people, we've also got to make investments in figuring out how we can do that digitally in order to reach people who are far away much more cost effectively and create greater benefits for everybody um, around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Panelists, um, you were just fantastic. Um, I can't thank you enough for um, all of your comments. And we look forward to seeing you next year in 2022. Thank you and goodbye.